I think that if we're going to be having a, uh, a calling out the inconsistencies of our of our opponents or of the people that we want to try to move away from, we have to make sure we minimize our own inconsistencies as well. So there's got to be some cleaning house as far as you know looking to see what's compatible in our own set of ideas at least at some level, because they're going to want to push back on uh, on inconsistencies that they see. That's part of the political back and forth. Something else I just wanted to share, everybody who knows me and those of you who are here for the first time will learn now that Leo Strauss is so important for me. In a course on Marx, he said this amazing thing to his class. He said, if your goal is equality, then you have to overcome the main sources of equality. Now, the main source of equality is the division of labor. And the main source of the division of labor is the division of the sexes. So therefore, it's a very easy chain of reasoning. If you're aiming at equality, you want to overcome the division of the sexes. And in some sense, we see that process playing out. It's another way of getting a handle on what's going on now. And what's so important about the fact that Strauss observed it in 1950 or whenever he did, is that when we read these old books or older scholars, we're not just doing it with this antiquarian interest. It's because in many cases, they saw the principles that we now are dealing with at the phase of their consequences. So, you know, they, in some sense, nipped it at the bud theoretically by highlighting what was going on. And we're living with the uh, aftermath of all of that. So also in response to what um, Spencer had said, rightly so, we don't just want to have an academic debate about whether or not Hobbes and Machiavelli both philosophized or whatever the case is. It's a relevant question because we have reference to those models. For example, if we say we're totally against postmodern demasculinization, okay? Dehumanization, demasculinization. Okay. All right. Well, now we need to have an alternative. One of the places we go to for the alternatives is that grab bag of the history of political philosophy. We're going to reassert Machiavellian man, for example, like Michael Anton seems to be doing to a certain extent. We're going to reassert Hobbesian man, as Carl Schmitt tried to do to a certain extent. We're going to reassert Aristotelian man or something like that, right? So that's my intention in trying to think about those figures. The historical interest is one thing, but the fact that that's where we might land as we turn away from post-modernity. And therefore, we need to understand the territory where we're landing, you know, whether we assert one or the other thing. Last point that I want to bring up here is just that besides all of these philosophical tendencies, and of course, the postmodern attack on manliness and on nature is a part of this. We also have the whole tradition of revealed religions, which also have a teaching about what it is to be a man, a father, a brother, a neighbor, the head of a family, all of these kinds of things, all of the obligations, somebody who's the source of tradition, of passing tradition down, of honoring it, the scholars and the teachers of the religious traditions. So it's not just that the whole philosophical territory is upended by the postmodern attack. We also have this, the religious traditions. And I don't want to say only Christianity, because for me, the Judaism is closer. But in both of these cases, you still have a meaning of manliness or a meaning of the good man that, yeah, it interlaces with the philosophical tradition, no doubt. There's a lot of Aristotle in the Christian tradition. There's a lot of Aristotle in the Jewish tradition as well, Maimonides in particular. But we have to have both of those things on the table. We need, simply stated, to reassert the possibility of a decent religious life, a decent philosophical life that avoids this corrosive attack on the two pillars of Western civilization. The attack that's going on at all fronts right now. It's happening in the schools. It's happening in the institutions. Everywhere you look, somebody's gunning for the pillars of the West. And we need to defend those, but we need to understand what we're getting ourselves into when we do that so that when we land, we're not left saying, oh gosh, there's a contradiction that we didn't think through. And now they're going after it. How did that happen? Was our, you know, we got to be prepared for everything as far as the battle goes. Uh, but I think it's largely in line, Jack, with what uh, both you and Spencer had said and what both of you are doing each in your own way. So I don't know if I'm adding anything new there, only just to say that these are the options open to us and why the old thinkers always matter to us. If they catch it before we got the consequences, we need to know that. Last thing I'll say, Strauss in On Tyranny, his amazing book, A Commentary on Xenophon's Hiero, where he also has a back and forth with Alexander Kojev, a Hegelian philosopher, Strauss says in the end of his restatement of on tyranny, the globalist tyranny that awaits us if we follow Hegel's end of history thinking as we get it in Kojev, the global tyrant that awaits us will command his scientists to prove that there are no natural sources of human inequality. He will command his scientists and his biologists to lie 
about the nature of human life. He will force them to tell globalist lies. He wrote that in 1950 or whenever he had his debate with Kozhev. How did he see then that there was going to be a globalist scientific tyranny that lies about human nature, where the tyrant forces his biologists and his scientists to lie because he understood it at the level of first principles. And then we have to clean up the mess at the level of its consequences. So if we can shorten that process, hit the principles before the consequences hit us, then I think that would be a helpful operation. Spencer. I, I, I'd like to return first and foremost to Michael's sort of reference to received or revealed religion, because I think that very much does add something new and crucially important. Um, and I and I should maybe make a note, though, before I do that, that I absolutely co-sign the urgent necessity of asking questions like, does Machiavelli agree with Aristotle about masculinity and manhood? Um, to what extent do their views overlap? Which of their views do we endorse or which parts of their various views do we endorse for all the reasons that that Michael identified? Um, I, 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 and and, and I, I, I didn't mean in any way to minimize that. I mean, it would be silly of me to minimize that project since as you indicate, right, like I'm sort of daily engaged in it, but um, it, 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 I didn't mean to minimize it by separate, by distinct, distinguishing it from what a, a new development that I believe really stands outside of this tradition. In some ways, one of the most valuable things that's emerging out of this conversation is the discernment of that tradition and the ability to distinguish between that and this kind of post-humanist uh, global tyrannous uh, idea, which I do sort of, the, again, the more you talk about it, the more I, rel I, I do think it is the spirit of Faust. Um, and that by identifying these things at first principles, as you as you indicate Strauss did, right, like we, we do sort of see exactly where they are going. I, I, I've sort of been saying for a while that there ought to be a German word for um, being shocked at something, but not being surprised at it. So that when the latest thing comes out of the mouth of the latest, you know, LGBTQIA plus plus advocate, like there was a, for example, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to like invoke these cursed words on your show, Jack, but the there was recently a rainbow dildo monkey um, that that danced at a children's event, right? Um, now it's impossible not to look at that and feel shocked in a sense of like one's uh, one's sensibilities are deeply offended um, because one has still emerged somehow through the this sort of terrible period of modernity with some moral sensibilities intact, right? One has one still has certain moral intuitions. One can still look at this thing and say that's appalling and disgusting, um, but one is not exactly surprised if one's paying attention to the implications of the the philosophy that was already completely laid out and on the table in, for example, the progressive era. I mean, people that we haven't talked about really yet to, uh, so much are the social Darwinists and the social um, gospel theorists, theologians of kind of the American progressive era, Walter Rauchenbusch, whose name I can never quite pronounce, but Wood, you know, Woodrow Wilson, Charles Beard, all of these folks who are proposing a kind of ceaseless march of history um, that does do away with all of the kind of ongoing development of tradition that we've been talking about, figure it however you want. Maybe there are breaks involved, but it's it's an identifiable tree that's growing in certain directions. Um, the, it seems to me that the progressive philosophy really says, well, actually, that is just a kind of uh, we can we can scrap all of that because we've moved beyond it in a certain sense. Um, and the catch always turns out to be that in order to stand outside the Hegelian uh, advance of history and evaluate where it is going and then push it further forward, you yourself have to kind of exempt yourself from that process. So everybody else is sort of churning along in this uh, historicist relativist soup, but the progressive autocrat basically says, no, I see where all of this is going. And so I'm going to impose my view of where it's going upon you. And that is, is essentially the logic that that you're identifying, Michael, I, I think, right, is, is well, I see that the world is um, developing in a certain way, and therefore um, I'm going to hasten that development along by steamrolling over whatever pesky objections I may receive from people that just want to kind of live their lives the way that their parents did or, or carry the traditions of their forefathers into the future. Um, and that steamrolling is kind of that attitude, the, the disdain with which um, our sort of modern autocrats look at people in the middle of America and, and sniff at them as if 
if they were, to quote our uh, great leader Obama, right? They were just clinging to their Bibles and their guns. Um, well, where does that attitude come from? Come from? It comes precisely from this attitude that there's like a kind of course of history, we can be on the right side of it. Um, and the catch is that in order to do that, you have to basically be the only person who's able to stand outside and dictate and see clearly without any of the impositions of, of you know, your own context, your own place and time, you, the great progressive autocrat, are going to be the leader of all things. Mm -hmm.